Welcome to today's worship service hosted by the Congregational Church of Wells as we gather on the second Sunday in Lent. I am grateful for the continued dedication of the worship team as they plan these online services and thanks to the musicians who do so much to enrich these experiences. We have several Zoom meetings scheduled for this coming week. On Monday at 6 p.m. is worship team, Tuesday at 6 p.m. is trustees, and 7 p.m. is diaconate, and Wednesday at 7 p.m. is executive council. Let us join together now for our call to worship. Pilgrims, we are invited to journey through this season of Lent towards the one who calls us each by a new name. Disciples, we walk with Jesus wherever he leads us, pulling our fears, our doubts, and our longings behind us. Believers, we seek to trust the God who always surprises us, whose promises take on flesh and blood in the good news called Jesus. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time. All the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. Bane and Blessing, pain and pleasure by the cross are sanctified. Peace is there that knows no measure, joys that through all time abide. Let us join together now for our opening prayer. Though people may turn their backs on us, you do not hide your face from us. Though others may try to take away our hope, you assure us of that future waiting for us. You speak your name, inscrutable creator, and it is enough. When we try to dictate our fears to you, you invite us to follow you into self-denial and service. As we struggle to shape our lifestyle to yours, you carry us with you wherever we go. You speak your good news, teacher of open hearts, and it is enough. Though we have done nothing to earn them, you pour out the gifts of grace and mercy upon us. When we stumble over our lack of trust, you set us back on our feet to follow you into the kingdom. You speak your peace, breath of holiness, and it is enough. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And now as we share in our joys and concerns, I would like to once again express my thanks to all those who are calling or keeping in touch in various ways with members and friends of the church family. Judy Ryan, the chair of our care team, writes the following. There may be some who don't know about Marty's death, but for my part of the prayer concerns, I would ask for prayers for Amy and Chris, Tim and Jenny, and myself at this difficult time. The outpouring of love and support since Marty's sudden death last Friday from a massive stroke has been overwhelming and I am truly grateful to everyone. Right now, there are no words to adequately express my thankfulness. A celebration of Marty's life will be held on Friday, June 25th at 11 a.m. at St. Mary's Church on Eldridge Road. Judy also writes the following, sharing uh, the joys and concerns of the congregation. Continued prayers for Marilyn, Todd, 
Paulina, Emily, Gloria, and Tim. We ask for prayers as well for Jennifer, Nancy, Ginny, Jean, Emma, Tony, David, Nadine, and Shannon. Prayers as well for Jenny, Roberta, William, Jen, Harry, Carol, Bill, Kevin, Bobby, and Alan. And finally, we ask for prayers for Selena, John, Amy, Courtney, Jean and Neil, Lee and Rita, June, Christine, Claire, Carol, Gary, Cindy, Steve, Ray, and Larry. There are many in our circle of church family and friends who continue to mourn the loss of loved ones during the past many months since we've been unable to safely gather together. May special memories fill their hearts with peace and comfort. And now let us join for our pastoral prayer. God of love and grace, as we continue on our Lenten journeys, we give thanks for the power of your spirit to give us the strength that we need to walk faithfully in your paths. As your son carried his cross in obedience to your will, may we be willing to make sacrifices in faithfulness to your calling in our lives so that we might reflect your love for others. Help us to set our minds on divine things. God, as our nation reaches another tragic landmark of 500,000 deaths related to COVID-19, we feel a profound sense of grief for those losses that have been felt by so many. We pray for comfort for those who are mourning, healing for those who are currently infected, and a speedy distribution of the vaccine which offers so much hope in the midst of this ordeal. We lift up in prayer those that we name in our joys and concerns, and we ask that you offer healing and comfort, strength and encouragement and hope to all. And now as we offer these prayers before you, Lord, let us also join in a moment of silence, remembering those concerns that lie deep within each one of our hearts. Now let us pray in the words that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Jesus.
This morning's scripture is from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. And he called to him the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Have you ever thought about the meaning behind your given name? What did your name say about you, your family history, and the hopes and aspirations of your family of origin? In my own case, for example, my middle name, Wynne, was part of my mother's maiden name, Win Roberts. I would invite you to think about your own names and what they say about your identity. The names of the people that we come across in the Bible say much about their identity as well. The name Moses, for example, means the one who draws out, an appropriate name for someone who was drawn out of the Nile River and later would draw his people out of slavery in Egypt to the freedom of the Promised Land. The name Abram means exalted father, which God changes to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. Likewise, his wife's, wife's name is changed from Sarai to Sarah, a less archaic, archaic form of the word meaning princess. And the name Jesus means God saves, certainly a name which sums up the core of Jesus' purpose on earth. As people of faith, the names that we are given say much about who we are, but there are also names that we give to ourselves which say much about who we are as well. For example, we give ourselves the name Disciples of Jesus Christ. A disciple is someone who follows someone else. As Christians, as people who center our faith on Jesus, we are followers of Jesus Christ. The first followers of Jesus, those who were called by Jesus, teach us much about what it means to live out the meaning of the word disciple. They sacrifice much to follow Jesus, but Jesus promises that their sacrifices will lead to great joy Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew 19, verse 29, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. The, the disciples often didn't get it, just like us. 
we will see that every time that Jesus describes the events leading to Holy Week, the disciples will have an uncanny knack of saying something really dumb. But in the end, the disciples are transformed from confused followers to courageous leaders of the new community gathered in Jesus' name. Indeed, the twelve who followed Jesus teach us much about what it means to be called disciples in the 21st century. There's another name which has special meaning to churches like ours. That name is Pilgrim. The Pilgrims were those who settled in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620 after leaving England and crossing the Atlantic on the Mayflower. Their goal was to separate from the Church of England and form a theocracy, a commonwealth governed by God. The Pilgrims were among those who helped shape the United Church of Christ, the denomination with which this church is affiliated. Pilgrims understood that their faith is a journey, and it is a fitting name for us, especially during this Lenten season. By saying that our faith is a journey, we are saying that we are always on the move, that we are always growing, that we have never fully arrived as we seek to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. We are, in short, living out the motto of the United Church of Christ that says that God is still speaking. More specifically, by calling ourselves pilgrims, we are saying that we expect to grow in our faith during this Lenten season and that our relationship with God will be deeper and more intimate on Easter Sunday than it was on Ash Wednesday. We are indeed pilgrims, seeking to experience new life as we grow in our relationship with God through Christ. Underlying all these needs, all these names that we give to ourselves, disciple and pilgrim, is the all-encompassing name Christian. What does that name say about us? Jesus' words in our passage in Mark gives us some focus as we strive to relate that name to our lives with a sense of integrity. Jesus says, if any want to become my follower or my disciples, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? These are pretty tough words and can lead us to wonder if we really want to call ourselves Christians, especially if the identity requires of us to be willing to give up everything for the sake of Christ. But Jesus makes clear that the name Christian not only has a cost, but also brings with it great joy. For as Jesus said in John's Gospel, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. The name Christian comes with a cost, but that identity comes with great joy as well. By calling ourselves Christians, we are saying that we are committing ourselves to a life of love, forgiveness, graciousness, and new beginnings. So how do we apply all this to our daily lives? Do we go home and rid ourselves of all of our possessions? That's not likely to happen, is it? But we can have a different attitude about our lives and all that goes with them. If we look at all as belonging to God and not something that we hoard for our own selfish purposes, and if we are willing to use all that God has given to us with a sacrificial love that reflects the love of Christ, then I believe that we are picking up our cross and following Jesus in our daily lives. Every time we serve in Christ's name, in our families, in our church, in our community, and beyond, I believe that we lose ourselves to Christ's purposes. The United Church of Christ Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann, in a 1993 book entitled Biblical Perspectives on Evangelism, describes faith, the Christian faith, as a matter of switching stories. Brueggemann argues that if you are a Christian, the stories that tells you who you are, the story that gives you your name, 
is not ultimately the story of your parents, ancestors, gender, ethnic group, or social class. It is the story of the Bible, the story of vocation, promise, deliverance, and gift. It's your family history, the story that defines who you are and what is really going on in the world. In short, you are lovingly created for service to the true and living God. You belong to the God of Jesus Christ. I believe that's a great way to sum up what it means to give ourselves the name Christian. We are those who belong to the God of Jesus Christ. The Congregational Church of Wells is profoundly grateful for the support of so many in the midst of these difficult times. Thanks to your pledges and donations, the Church is able to serve in Christ's name and share the love of Christ with all. And now may we find the road that leads to life. May we take the turns that brings right relationships. May we pause to accompany others on the way. And may we journey with God through Lent and long for the horizon and dawn and the grace. Amen.